Okay, good afternoon to to all the participants for this particular seminar. So I would like to welcome everyone because today we're going to talk about what matters most in our profession, in our work as teachers. And a subheading or subtitle is none other than we will have to tackle how to improve our practice or practices as teachers. So before we formally begin, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Ernie Grillo. I'm a teacher just like you. I have been teaching and continue to teach for 32, 33 years. I have had teaching experience in the grade school, in high school, and now I'm handling classes in college and in the graduate school. So to formally begin our session, I would like to alert all the participants, all my fellow teachers, that this particular seminar session or module is all about our teaching. Or to put it precisely, it's about us. It's about the teacher. And we are going to focus on the teaching persona. Because when we focus on the teaching persona, we'll be able to have a deeper understanding of our key role as a teacher. And I think if you have been teaching for even just probably three years or even probably a couple of years, you must have realized not only the complexity of our work as teachers, but also the importance of our work as teachers. And definitely in this particular session, we're going to continue our preparation, our development, our improvement as teachers. Because in terms of the general goals of this particular module, we have to take away the self-doubt that we cannot become good teachers because we have the teachers, we have the capacity to do so. All we need to do is to exert a lot of effort. Indeed, it will have to take a lot of effort on our part and even probably courage to improve our knowledge and skills and even values and beliefs. And this particular seminar answers that particular call, including the second one, because we will be given the knowledge to be able to assess our teaching, whether our teaching is responsive to the needs of our students. And probably the most important general goal of this particular session is the last one, because we will prepare ourselves, because we continue to learn, we are lifelong learners, we continue to improve our art, science and not only an art and science but our craft of teaching we have to set aside the idea that we are improving we have been recognized as good teachers because of luck because of luck alone we have to recognize the fact that when we improve it is because of our own effort because we sought to improve our teaching practices and this particular seminar is a clear manifestation of your commitment, of your commitment to improve your craft as teachers. So our goal, general goal then, is successful teaching. Sometimes we call it good teaching, sometimes effective teaching. But no matter what we call it, this particular seminar is for you, is for everyone here, because you can do it. We can do it. You can do it. Of course, I can do it. This is Rosie the Riveter. The history teachers are probably familiar with this particular picture, Second World War. When the United States went to war, uh, the young men, the middle-aged men, and had to go war I mean, to do factory work. And the millions of women in the United States volunteered to do that work. So here, I suppose the key word then here, here again is volunteer because I don't think we were forced to become teachers. We volunteered ourselves to become teachers. And successful teaching, effective teaching, or good teaching is within our reach. We can do it. 
And, and therefore, this particular session or module is, as Mark Twain would always remind us, that we have two birthdays. This is a time for us to rediscover who we are. What matters most in teaching? And then, because we have discovered and we have reflected on what matters most in teaching, then we have the knowledge and the skills to be able to improve our teaching. Because this seminar is meant to help us to find out why we were born, to rediscover why we were born. It is important for us to go back to that particular idea that when we took, took the exams in order to become a licensed professional teacher, we belong to a profession not only because of the fact that we have a number, 0015309 or whatever number uh, you have, but rather because we deserve to be in that profession because we behave as a professional. We enact our knowledge and skills as a professional, particularly where it matters most, none other than the classroom. So let's have a quick thinking activity, probably a minute for you to be able to reflect on what I have just said. And the question is a fundamental one. Why did I choose to become a teacher? Why did I choose teaching? What matters most in teaching? Why did I choose to become a teacher? If you want, you can probably send your notes uh, using the chat, chat, uh, chat box, or you can send your notes to someone, a colleague of yours who is not attending the seminar, and probably you have told him or her that you will attend this particular seminar. All right, so we proceed, and let's take a look at there is a central teaching question that we need to answer before we proceed. And indeed, uh, looking at the idea of John Hattie, the visibility of teaching and learning, when he was asked this particular question, this uh, expert in effective teaching from New Zealand, uh, Dr. Hattie, what do you think is the rule of thumb regarding effective teaching and learning? And because John Hattie was involved in the meta-analysis, he mines mining. Okay. He looks at thousands of research studies and try to make a, although a tentative conclusion regarding what is an, if what is effective teaching or what are the characteristics of an effective teacher. And regarding effective teaching, he said, the student should know what is going on in the mind of the teacher. And the teacher must know what is going on in the mind of the students. And therefore, because this is a very good rule of thumb regarding such successful or effective teaching, I would like to communicate to everyone the central teaching question. And this is the central teaching question because this particular question is just like an essential question. It will recur naturally, naturally, even if we try to evade it, even if we try to escape, escape it. And the question is none other than, is it worth the time and effort to revisit my teaching practices? Is, is it worth the time and effort to revisit my teaching practices? Am I effective in managing my class? Am I effective in interpreting the curriculum? Am I effective in helping my students learn? Whether you are a social studies teacher, a science teacher, a Filipino teacher, or preschool, senior high, or even probably college teachers, if there are college teachers here in this particular personal meeting room. Is it worth the time and effort to revisit one's teaching practices? And in order for us to be able to answer maybe tentatively, but hopefully fully, this particular question at the end of two hours at 5 p.m., we have related questions. 
related questions to the central teaching problem because we all know that the central teaching problem is a huge problem in terms of coverage and therefore we narrow it down to the three related questions number one number two and number three the first one is begin we have to begin with our purpose and our passion we have to begin with our purpose and our passion why should i align my teaching to something that is greater than me to something that is bigger than me to something which we might call our vocation to something that we might call the core values of the school because it's really impossible based on experience this is just an opinion it's really impossible to teach well in a context a culture a specific setting like your school without loving the school without believing in the philosophy that the school spouses the second question is we will take a look at based on my own experience also four key areas that i think are very critical in terms of critical success factors when we talk about effective teaching there could be seven there could be 15 there could be four but later on i will explain regarding the standard of choosing the four practices and in line with the passion the purpose and the practice we all know that as teachers we are reflective practitioners and therefore we should be given the opportunity to reflect whether am i still aligned is my teaching belief is my teaching value or set of beliefs and values is still aligned with my calling especially with the schools core values am i teaching well what are the indications that i am teaching well what are the indications that the students are learning so reflection is also important in fact in the first objective in the first question we will already take a look at how we can reflect or how you can reflect on your teaching because there might be not enough time to be able to reach this particular question or question number three all right so we have number one central teaching question and then the related questions in order for us to be able to put a boundary to be able to put a marker to be able to come up with questions rather answers for that particular central teaching question so i would like to invite everyone to take a look at your own objectives what are your objectives when you enlisted for this particular seminar when you contacted mr rintoy or catalyst to 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 attend this particular seminar what are your objectives are those objectives aligned with what i have enumerated and explained regarding the why the what and then the how very important questions so i would like now to provide you with an opportunity to to take a look at the objectives and then to take a look at your own objectives why do i have to align my teaching with the core values of the school what are the key areas that i need to improve on in order for me to ascertain or to keep track of the fact that my students are learning they are learning the curriculum they are learning how to think they are learning how to be good people because i'm also interested in character education in fact it is not an afterthought i am interested in character education and then how do i reflect how do i reflect about these points I recommend most probably you can write them down even though you may probably have an access to this particular module or PowerPoint presentation later on. So let's move on and let's take a look at the first part. Let's take a look at the first part. Why are the core values important? 
why why is it that reflecting on my calling as a teacher is important because i know that when i entered this particular profession yes i am a professional but this profession is not only a well the way i see it it's not only a job for me it's actually my vocation because i teach with my life so let's take a look at the, the core values why are they important let me just give you an example of real core values taken from a Catholic school. They have three. They have fides, they have caritas, and they have libertas. So they say they have faith in God. The second one has something to do with charity. And then the third one has something to do with liberty or freedom. Freedom from ignorance, freedom from poverty, and freedom from indifference. And therefore, we assume, and not only assume, it must be taking place, it must have taken place, it must be taking place next week if they're opening the school year 2021-2022, that these core values are being lived and not only talked about and not only displayed in the school corridors. Really, we hope to go back, uh, well, hopefully middle of the year next year or towards the end of the year next year to our campus or campuses. And we can see the mission, the vision, and the core values of the school. They are not just meant for display. They are not just meant for explanation. Faith, charity, and freedom will have to be lived by the entire school community. In our teaching, in our reading of the curriculum, in our lesson planning, or probably even unit planning, if you do unit planning, these core values are very much alive. Because precisely when we talk about the product of the school, when we talk about the educant or the pupil or the student, right? We want that particular student or all of our students to have faith, charity, and freedom. To have knowledge, the skills, the attitude, and to be able to do, to do faith, charity, and freedom. Not only within the confines of the school, but most especially when they leave the school or outside of the school. So the, the question here regarding the first part is, well, I would like to invite you to revisit your core values, your mission, your vision, the philosophy of education, the description of the ideal graduate, whether you call it virtues or you call it values. What are those core values? What are those virtues? Is it also fides, libertas, and caritas? So therefore, when we, when we started to think about those core values besides the fact that i can do this i can become a better teacher an effective teacher a good teacher i can take away and set aside that imposter syndrome because this is me i have a successful class in social studies i manage well that particular class i taught them how to use how to learn the content by using source documents i scaffolded the lessons in such a way that I avoided overload on the part of the students, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? This is all. This is all about me. Most especially because this is about the school that I love, that I care for. Right? Because it's difficult, really, to be. To, to expect yourself to teach well in a setting wherein you are not happy. So it has to begin with the school. It has to begin with the school. 
But before we take a look at the school, right, we have to take a look at our vocation as teachers because uh, teaching is a calling, it's service. If you take a look at the second, at the second sentence, it's about service. As they say in a Catholic school, it's about being a servant leader. You are there because you want to transcend yourself. You want to give not only a part of yourself, but your entire self. And how do you do that? By becoming a... servant inside the classroom who teaches with his life as if you're saying that i am the curriculum right i plan my lessons well i not only follow for example the format but more important than the format is i take a look at the lesson plan and try to imagine it as a story Okay. The key word now is imagine because, you know, according to research, when teachers plan the lessons based on research, they say uh, experts have come up with this particular idea based on research that the more that the more successful teachers, the more effective teachers imagine how they will teach a day before, two days before, three days before. And not only imagine, but they talk about how they will teach with a colleague and probably listen to the colleague for advice, for points for improvement. So they don't only do it or, for example, when they are inside the classroom, which is very, which is really difficult. So this is Elliot Eisner, and he says, when you talk about teaching, it's really a connoisseurship. And just like research, according to Eisner, teaching is just like you are being a connoisseur. You're taking a look at the story, and in what particular part of the story will you ask a question? Will you pose a problem? Will you give a good example, a clear and concrete example, etc.? And, and, and I know that you can come up with uh, several more, probably a hundred more examples of regarding what this particular calling or service is all about. When we talk about the curriculum, when we talk about professional development, when we talk about actual teaching inside the classroom, mentoring students, even coaching fellow teachers, etc. So the point is, when we talk about teaching, it's a vocation. It's not a job. Salary is important, but my reward as a teacher could not be measured by numbers. All right. So we have to remind ourselves of this particular point. And therefore, we have to reconnect with our purpose. Uh, remember in teacher's college, when you were probably, I don't know, first year, third year, you were required requested to uh, to write your own philosophy of teaching and we have to reconnect with that philosophy of teaching number one number two number three i'm sure these particular points came out in that philosophy of teaching document or you must have revised it and these particular points came out in that particular teaching document i am an integrator of learning i facilitate and then at the same time, towards the end, or you in the middle, I integrate learning because I am the expert okay, helping apprentices inside the classroom. I do make a difference. I make an impact. And that particular impact could be seen even years from now, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And I can give you a clear example just yesterday, you may probably say, one student of mine called me up and we, what, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and we met via Zoom. And he was telling me about all of his success, that's all the successful things that he has encountered or he is in right now. And he credits the school, he credits his teachers about it. 
And therefore, I am the curriculum. And I said a while ago, I teach with my life. My teaching, my job cannot be separated from me, the teaching persona. All right, so we begin with that vocation. And in giving life to that particular vocation so that it's very much alive, I would like to propose that we always have to have a reflective stance. Whether that reflection, okay, whether that reflection comes before teaching, during teaching, which is more difficult, or after teaching, whether alone or better, a better situation, a better context would be to be reflecting together with colleagues, which later on we will try to take a look at. But I would also like to propose that in order for us to live up to our vocation as teachers, we only not have to focus on our teaching, on the teacher, but also on our students, on learning. Because teaching and learning are just like two sides of the same coin. One side is teaching effective because on the other side of the coin, on the other side of the coin is learning or the student. I taught well, I'm a good teacher because my students learn. Therefore, we realize then that we have a responsibility to know learning. And therefore, if we have that particular responsibility to understand learning, the process of learning, how does it take place? What are the snags? What are the, what are the things that prevent my students from learning a, a factual knowledge, for example, a conceptual knowledge, or probably even a procedural knowledge, or even a theme? So we have to understand learning. And of course, if we're going to understand the process, not only the product, we have to understand the person, the pupil, the education. We have whether those papers are exercises, whether those papers are essays, whether those papers are long tests, unit tests, we have to spend time talking to them, uh, whether in the context of, for example, in Zoom, when you group them, when they collaborate, and when you visit them, and when you eavesdrop, quote unquote, spy on them. And while spying on them, you come up with questions and you pose those questions in order for them to think. Or in the context of a one on one chat. It's important to understand the learning and, of course, the learner. So we have to have a reflective stance. And I think it's a paradigm shift. Even though probably even as early as the 1970s, we have been, we have many experts, many theories, researchers tried to open our hearts and minds regarding the importance of looking at teaching from the perspective of the student. But I think it's still a paradigm shift. It's a paradigm shift because many times we are so engrossed with what we do that sometimes we forget what happens in the other side of the coin. So take a look at this particular example. May I ask and pose the following questions? In your current teaching, what do you do to provide support to students' understanding and use of feedback. Uh -huh. Pero sir, di ba, when we talk about feedback, it's about composing the feedback, coming up with the feedback, and communicating the feedback to the student, as long as the feedback is according to the standards. Di ba yun, sir, yung sinasabi ni Robert Marsano? But the question now is paradigm shift. Right? How did the student make meaning of that feedback? And then, okay, how did the student use the feedback in a future action? 
Second question, have you ever thought about where does your responsibility end and where does the student's responsibility begin when we talk about feedback? Right? So I must agree with you if you're thinking right now that this particular, these questions could probably consume two hours or three hours more of a discussion, including feedback strategies. But this is what we call the reflective stance. We, on, we do not only reflect on our teaching, but we reflect on the impact, the effect of our teaching. And these are very powerful questions. They are, they are, they are neatly connected to what we do, whether what we do has something to do with planning, curriculum, teaching, assessing, even evaluation. So let me invite you again to take a look at these particular questions for probably a few more seconds. So we move on, aims and values. We go back calling, vocation, servant leader. I serve, I work with children or adolescents, or if you're into adult learning, you're doing andragogy, adults. So for example, in my case, the learners that I handle are adults. I don't normally use pedagogy or pedagogy but rather andragogy or andragogy, right? So that's vocation. And then we take a look at core values. We go back to the fides, the caritas, the libertas, or your own version. In fact, your own version is better because it's your school, because it's yours, right? Because it's yours. And when we talk about the aims of the school, the core values of the school, or the mission and vision of your school. We talk about ideas and ideals that are worth achieving, states that are worth achieving. Because why spend 13 years K to 12? And why spend four more years in college or five more years or six more years, depending on the course, if not that what you are doing, what you're aiming for, is something that has a value, something that is valuable. And this is really what matters most in our teaching. One of the things that matter most in our teaching. Because we have to continually think about the core values that we're trying to inculcate, that we're trying to teach our students, that we're trying to prepare them to live these core values because we want them to become good persons. As in positive psychology or positive education, we would always say, we want a flourishing individual. That that particular individual later on will be, will be civic-minded, will be a citizen, will be able to think for himself, will be able to push the envelope of the common good. So values are important. And let me again invite you to go back to the core values that you have listed down at the beginning of this particular session or seminar. Because the core values are important part of a teacher's work. And I would like to shift the focus on the we. So hindi lang yung teacher, pero yung grade school unit, yung middle school young high school or senior high school or the entire school what do we want to achieve we are rowing in one direction what do we want to achieve our curriculum is clearly understood by everyone and more importantly our curriculum represents okay is a medium for us to be able to achieve the mission and vision of the school our teaching method or methods, whether team-based learning, collaborative learning, problem-based learning, or project-based learning, all 
different frameworks or models regarding group learning, whatever it is, are clear indications that we all have the same understanding, probably not the same, but essential agreements about how to enact, how to plan, how to use this in order for us, not only for the students to understand the curriculum, but to learn the values of the school. How do we achieve these goals, the values of the school? And then what are my contributions? What are your contributions? What are your contributions to the group, to the school unit, to the grade school teachers, to the high school teachers, probably the college faculty, in order for the school to be able to achieve, to be able to help the students' values. And I think this is important. I want to highlight the we because in the meta-analysis of research, uh, of course, we understand meta-analysis. Uh, you, you have, you have several, several large studies, large quote-unquote studies. In one large study, hundreds of research studies were synthesized and they were able to see the impact of certain factors in terms of effectiveness in the way they bring about learning or development on the part of the student. And in the meta-analysis conducted by researchers along this line, effective teaching, what is the most important factor in the learning of the student outside of the student? Well, number one, it's the teacher, not the curriculum. It's the way the teacher interprets the curriculum and and implements the curriculum. It's the way the teacher uh, deals with the student, cumulative. The teacher is the most important factor outside of the student. Of course, because we all know that uh, you never work harder than your students. Because no matter how good you are, you can never ever do the learning for the student. That's why outside of the student. But take a look at the we. So, hindi lang pala teacher, number one teacher. Number two, the most important factor in the learning of the student are the teachers. Because the number one factor in the learning of the student is called collective teacher efficacy. The teachers believe, and rightfully so, that they can make a difference in the learning of their students. The teachers expect, and rightfully so, that everyone in the class will learn, even the more difficult to teach students. So again, collective teacher efficacy. And the number is mind-boggling because if you have a point eight in terms of the impact, right, statistics, it's already a big number, meaning to say, it has a very big chance of leading the student to learn. But here the number is 1.57, almost twice the 0.8, 1.57. Well, of course, because it's collective. And that's why I highlighted the we, highlighted the we, collective teacher efficacy. So it's worth investing time, right? It's worth investing time. What are my school's core values? I know I have memorized them. I know I understand them. How do I live them? How do, how do these core values shape me as a teacher? How does it shape my pedagogy? How does it the way I read their paper, right? That in reading their paper, there is always a face behind the paper. I always have to remind myself. And what does, what, what is value? Our core value, because the core value teaches me or tells me that I don't actually teach a class. 
but I teach a student in the class. And, and therefore, how do we treat and not only teach our students? How do we treat our students? Do we see them as human persons with freedom, with voice, with choice? Right? Because if we take the, the word treat seriously, then most probably we will have a relational pedagogy or pedagogy. And in a relational pedagogy, we focus not only on the content. Of course, the content is important. We cannot teach in a vacuum. There has to be standards and benchmarks. There has to be competencies. And we believe that our curriculum is world-class, well-researched, right? But aside from the textbook, aside from the methodology, the teaching method, aside from the content, and besides the number of days, for example, you're doing it semesterly or quarterly or trimester, there could be other factors. The most important thing in my pedagogy is relational because I focus or I make the student the center of my teaching, rightfully so, because the core values are about a person. They're not about a document. They're not about a place or they're not about the curriculum, but it's about a person. It's molding that person to become someone whom we think, whom we believe will be able to contribute for the good, for the good of society, for the good of the community. So this is my, this is my, this is the thing that I have to always consider, right? Because here I combine not only learning, learning on the part of the student, but also the learner himself. I form a very good identity of who the learner is. And it also contributes to my teacher identity, that I am not only a purveyor of knowledge, someone who communicates knowledge, but someone who forms and hopefully even transforms persons. So relational pedagogy or pedagogy. Right, so invite you for probably two minutes. You take a look at the word creation, calling, service, serv servant leadership, the core values of my school, connecting my purpose as a teacher to the core values of the school, right? So if you can come up with one statement that probably captures a central idea that probably captures what I was able to talk about. And then what was your opinion about that central idea of yours? And then try to provide a support based on your experience, based on what you have seen, based on what you have heard, based on what you have experienced regarding vocation and core values. So a couple of minutes. It's probably the fastest two minutes. Let's take a look at our next move now is to examine the important quality of a good teacher. Yes, it's not an error. It's not a typing error. We're not talking about the qualities of a good teacher because, again, that would probably take a full semester of discussion. But rather, I would like to, this is only an opinion based on experience, based on my reading, as a, especially as a graduate school professor, as someone who was, who was able to observe uh, probably close to a thousand classes. Close to a thousand classes in those 30 years, whether in the public school or in the private school system. Right? And I would like to propose later on that particular most important quality of a good teacher. 
But before we do that, we take a look at detour, at a detour, because this is important. Okay, it's not really a side discussion, but rather a discussion that will help us enlighten us have a deeper understanding of the vocation and the core values which we discussed a while ago. And this detour is looking at your own beliefs as teachers. Because this is important. What are my beliefs about my students, my classroom, the academic material that I'm going to teach? Right? Because those beliefs, those values function as a filter. This is important content because it is in accordance with my belief as a teacher, right? It's a filter. This is something that I would like to emphasize because it is important based on my value or a belief as a teacher. When I search for materials, okay, the belief or my value serves as a guide because I believe in developmentally appropriate practices because I believe in the universal design for learning, etc. So we have to revisit teacher beliefs. And we have to connect teacher beliefs <coughs> and purpose with actual teaching because it is important for us to realize that, number one, when we talk about our beliefs, our purpose, vocation, calling, okay, what we aspire for becomes real. You can see it in real life because teachers make plans think about it, conceptualize it, and then enact it. And if you're, if you're teaching five subjects or even probably six subjects or in the context of the online classroom, maybe you have a reduced load or, or the same, right? You can be sure that whatever those beliefs and the vocation and the core values, you enact them. And you also realize that the, your belief, your vocation, the core values, the purpose, they have an impact because it benefits other people, especially the students whom you're handling. They grow up to become better learners, cognitively speaking, because they can do higher order thinking, analysis, synthesis, comparing and contrasting. They become better persons because they become competent. And you can clearly see that when they listen, they know how to listen. They don't interrupt a discussion. They know the pillars of civilization. Please, thank you. I cannot do this, but I can do that for you. They provide an alternative. It's also a pillar of civilization or an apology when they commit a mistake when they must have probably have hurt someone they say sorry right so it benefits other people but we must also realize it benefits the teacher because he becomes a better person better at teaching better probably at, be, at being at being an administrator a department head a principal right so the key question then that also i would like you to focus on is as part of the reflective stance is to always look at your beliefs about learning about the learner about the subject area and about the curriculum and an important follow-through question is how do these beliefs contribute to my school's goals and my contribution to the school goals and my aspiration to become a better person, a better professional, a better teacher? So looking at core values, calling beliefs, what is that, what is that most important teacher quality then? Uh, just like what I said, uh, this is my opinion. This is based on my reading of the research literature. Uh, probably what I did was a qualitative metasynthesis. But more importantly, this is my product, a product of conversations with hundreds of teachers or probably close to 100 classroom teaching observations. 
and post-observation conferences. And I would say, if we are going to take a look at the core values, our calling as a teacher and the beliefs, then we have to turn our gaze to something as infectious like the virus. To something as infectious like the virus. Right? And this is none other than the smile of a teacher, which is enthusiasm. Do I enjoy? Am I excited? Do I find pleasure in my teaching activities? Do I enjoy? Am I excited? Am I still excited? Do I find joy in talking to my students? in reading their papers, in guiding them to distinguish between an SBIOO or SBO type of a sentence. Or if, if I'm teaching a research paper in tackling, for example, the research design, the methodology, the participants, the research site, etc. Or if I'm dealing with little kids, the preschool kids, that when they play, do I still find joy in guiding them when they play, whether it is a structured or pre-type of play? So this is the enthusiasm for teaching the content or for being with the children, whether the children are really children or adolescents or adults or students. Because enthusiasm is infectious. So a three-year veteran, a 15-year veteran, a 30-year veteran, a, I don't know, 40-year veteran. I saw in the internet a while ago that we, you have, a, I think, a 90-year-old teacher. Maybe it's fake news, <coughs> etc. Uh, this is a quality that, that a good teacher must have. For example, in professional development, even though I already know a lot about teaching, I still find joy in reading, in researching, probably in attending graduate school. So teacher enthusiasm, I would like to propose it. I would like to propose because it will sustain you. And it's not really only a proposal okay, because I saw it, I experienced it, or I continue to experience it. If you take a look at the second sentence, according to research, it's correlated with the quality of instruction or correlated with the quality of teaching. Well, this does not say anything about learning because it was not measured there. But in terms of the observation of people who were present in that classroom, In the way they probably look at the teacher, they uh, they studied the teacher, and they realized that because of the enthusiasm of the teacher, it correlates with the quality of teaching, the way the teacher would communicate the objectives, the way the teacher would probably even call the name of a student. There's a certain tone to it that clearly shows that that particular teacher is excited, he finds pleasure in it. And I think when we talk about enthusiasm, it's, it's uh, as enthusiasm as something that defines a good teacher, that helps us become a good teacher. It's more than wonder. It's more than inquiry. I think it's because of surprise. When we are reading an essay, we are surprised by this particular insight coming from a student. When we are reading a research report because we want to learn about a certain teaching method, we are surprised by this particular variable. When we are attending a professional development seminar and then the speaker mentions something about an idea, it's not only because we're wondering about it, we're surprised that this particular idea can really make a difference in our teaching. So surprise, being surprised is something that comes with enthusiasm, I think. It's more than wonder. It's more than inquiry. This is, again, based on experience. So, and then, of course, it's an antidote. The smiling face, right? It's an antidote to burnout. 
it's an antidote to burn out. And if it is going to work very well, I suggest that that enthusiasm to learn, that enthusiasm to teach, that enthusiasm to be able to develop a good relationship with the students, to be able to become better as a teacher, you, can, you should not practice quarantine. You should not practice social distancing or distancing for that matter. Because surprise, more than the wonder, all the wonder is also important. We can only do it if we flex, if we develop, if we build our muscles, relational muscles. Therefore, it's about ourselves available to other teachers. It's about seeking other teachers. It's about a community of teachers. It's, it's about not being isolated from our colleagues. Because when we talk about a teacher's professional identity, we don't only talk about the material resources or the ideas and practices that are valued, but also the way the teacher relates with these colleagues, with her colleagues. So it's also about relationships again with fellow teachers. All right, enthusiasm. Pwede ba yun? Okay. The most important quality, I would like now to request you to reflect on that particular proposal, the particular proposition. Especially reflect on your own experience. So the importance of a professional learning network. So three, two, one summarizer. What are the three things that I have learned from the part this particular, up to this particular part of the module? What are the two things that I'm thinking about it right now? What is one big idea? I invite everyone, probably a minute. <laughs> So let's move on. And before we leave the why, we introduce the how. We'll just probably spend a couple of minutes for this one before I give you a break at four o'clock in the afternoon. So yes, uh, we have to take care of our own professional development. And the third part of the module is none other than the how. So how do I reflect? But we introduce the professional development. We have to give importance to this, this uh, formats, to these opportunities to develop ourselves because it is important for us to realize our direct impact. Our calling as a teacher will be for nothing. The school's core values will not be implemented properly, will not be learned by the student. Our beliefs as a teacher will be for not or nothing. Okay. If we don't enjoy our own, if we don't take care of our own professional development. Because the point is, as a precursor to the third part is, we cannot give our students what we don't have. You know, this is a part of law, if I remember correctly. But in, in seminars, in teaching, uh, this is basically a quotable quote. You cannot give what you do not have. It's important to develop yourself, to learn, and probably to unlearn some of the things that you need to unlearn because there could probably be bad habits. There could probably be myths regarding evidence-based teaching, etc. So sometimes we have to unlearn. We learn. But more importantly, we continue to improve ourselves because how can we give ourselves fully if we are not prepared and we also realize that we have to do it every year we have to renew ourselves 
not only because the content is changing, there are new teaching methods, but we also realize again the paradigm shift that our students are not the same, not only in terms of the generation, whether the alpha or the generation Z, right? But rather, they are different because my, my students last year are different compared to my students this year. I handled grade four last year, grade four this year, but the grade four this year are different from the grade four last year. Right. So I would like now to stop here for a while and I would like to provide an opportunity for the participants to take a break at least for eight minutes. So we we regroup again at 4.08 and then we will start at 4.09 or 4.10, all right?
All right, so I think uh, we can start again. I hope you you are back in your places. So let's now take a look at the, the again, the, the central teaching question. Is it worth it to spend time reflecting, reviewing on my teaching practices? And the first related question, the first uh, related question about that particular central teaching question is why should I align my teaching to the core values of the school? I want to invite you and go back to this particular question. So let's now take a look at, let's now take a look at the second one. Let me just dislodge this one because it's not moving. And let me again look for it. Let's take a look at the what. What are the principles of effective teaching? And because this particular session is about passion, purpose, and practice, we have to take a look at the practices. We have to take a look at effective teaching. But we cannot cover all the principles. We cannot cover all the principles. And this is the reason why, because of the lack of time, I tried to draw up a list of what I think are the four most important principles that you have to think about, that you have to take care of, especially this coming school year, 2021-2022. The principles of effective teaching. I am sure there are more principles. There could be 15. There could be 10. In fact, I started with seven. And then looking at the time frame, looking at the schedule, I said four. Four would be enough, the four most important. So the principles are one, two, right? The teacher is a director. The second one is the focus of the teaching and learning process is the learner, not learners, not the class, but the individual student. The third principle and the fourth principle are this, that everyone has an opportunity or must be provided with an opportunity to learn. It is connected with what research findings have always been telling us regarding the fact that when we talk about effective teachers, right, these effective teachers have high expectations for their students, all students in the class. Now, the other one that we need to understand and go deeper into is we cannot teach all the content. If we do so, I think it would be almost impossible, again, based on experience. What we need to do is to study the curriculum and to teach only the essential content, what the students really need to understand. So the four. So the first two the learner as an individual, and we have to discover his background, knowledge, and skills, not, lo not only in terms of what are, what is, what does he understand about the content, but who is he as a learner? And then you are a director. You are just like in a play, in a setting wherein you have a play, and you're directing individuals. The third one has something to do with high expectations, right? Everyone here can learn, including those students who are having a difficult time trying to learn the content. And then, of course, the fourth one is I have to provide opportunities for every type of students, all kinds of minds, for them to be able to access the curriculum, that the curriculum is accessible to them. Do you have an additional principle? I'm sure you have. And I would like to invite you to take a look at that additional principle. Probably they sit down and give you a minute. So let's, this is Ernie Grius Lis. Okay, let me.
Okay, let me do something about that again. There you are. Number one, the teacher as the director. You are a director. You are a director. You know the art. You know the science of teaching, the science of teaching and learning, right? But also, not only the science, but you understand, okay? You, you don't only know the science of teaching, but you also understand the science of learning. As a director, you have to lead the students to learning. Whether that particular learning has something to do with cognition, cognitive development, social development, emotional development. But you are the director. And here, the things to consider if you are the director are none other than you have to learn how to walk in between this and this is a term which is borrowed from a japanese teaching methodology which is none other than kekan shedu and in kekan shedu it clearly highlights our role as a facilitator of learning because when we talk about our role as a director of the class as a director of the teaching and learning process it highlights our key role as the one who facilitates learning. The second one is learning how to let go, but not to let go totally. This is in accordance with a Chinese teaching methodology, which is Fang Su without Fang Yang. Charlene Tan, in, his, in her research in Shanghai, and we all know that Shanghai is the number one educational system in the world based on test results in PISA, P-I-S-A. Right, and, and, and here we highlight the key role of the teacher as the one who scaffolds, who prepares, okay, who asks key questions. Right? But at the same time, he knows that he must turn over that responsibility to the student at a certain point. But in turning over that responsibility, he must not turn it over totally because he must also be present she must also be present to serve as a guide i, I think even in the case of what they call hutagogy hutagogy is self-regulated learning and it rings a bell right because when we talk about asynchronous teaching diba? we do online and distance learning and the two key parts of online and this distance learning or what we call blended learning is what we call asynchronous and synchronous. And most probably when you talk about synchronous teaching and learning, it is basically hutagogy because you have to teach the student self-regulation, right? Manage my time. He must know how to manage his time. He must be able to know his priorities, right? He must be able to, to see for himself that this number one is this is not the number one priority, not number two, not number three. He must be able to look at reference materials, spot a good reference material, etc. But we all know that as teachers, we cannot totally rely on a so-called 100% self-regulated learner. That's why learn how to let go, but do not let go totally. Because even in the context of online and distance learning, we are still present. We are a text away. We provide the materials that the student will probably search, uh, look at, uh, neatly park in a learning management system, etc. And the third one is we allow the students to play the game. This is very important. If we are a director of learning, we learn how to walk in between desks, we facilitate learning, we learn how to let go but not let go totally because we want to develop self-regulated learners. But at the same time, we also allow the students to play the game. They have to play the game. They have to be at the forefront of the teaching and learning process and not the teacher most of the time talking, most of the time dictating, right? We have to give them a space in order for them to work along that space that they are given in for them to learn, for them to develop. We have to give them what we call a voice, a choice. So in doing so, 
as a director of learning, we have to take into consideration two very important areas, number one and number two. Assessment for learning and collaborative learning. And later on, I would like to explain to you why I have chosen this one-two combination. Assessment for learning and collaborative learning. Assessment for learning has something to do, we're very familiar with these points, right? It begins with the goals, okay? It begins with the checklist, with the rubric. Then it begins, then we have, we gather evidences in order for us to be able to see whether that student is performing according to the standards and then feedback to the students but more importantly just like what i said a while ago this is a new way of looking at feedback what does the student understand make meaning of of that particular feedback and how did the student or how will the student use the feedback future use and then peer assessment and self-assessment and here i would like again to go back to feedback because these are the strategies that i have seen that the good teachers use in their class classes based on my conversations with the teachers based on my reading of the research literature and also based on the classroom observations okay so we have three and take a look at this three and reflect on this three number one they use the classroom discussions and instructional activities as opportunities for formative assessment. They use the discussions and instructional activities. Remember, the instructional activities could also be opportunities when the students do collaborative work because they are in a group work setting or opportunities when the students are doing their portfolio because they want to display their knowledge and skills or instructional activities when the students are being tested quote unquote right because they are doing their performance tasks but the teacher do not look at it as testing as evaluating but rather as an opportunity for the teacher to know where they are because the teacher cannot bring them to a higher level where they should be if he does not bridge the gap regarding where they are and where the students should be. If you take a look at the second one, effective feedback during class activities, whether that particular feedback is a word, a question, an indication, a reference material, or even probably giving that particular student a handout or a note, etc. Okay, but it is important that the teacher will have to plan and implement the effective feedback. And what am I hinting at? Preparation. Preparation. You go inside the classroom, right? But you have, you have already prepared because you have studied the student especially the work of the student. And then the third one has something to do with we help the students develop how to assess themselves, especially in the context uh, of, the, of this particular situation that we are in now, because we are teaching online. And it is really important for the students to develop what we call executive functioning, right? I'm reading this particular paper but am I reading it correctly? How did the teacher teach us how to read it correctly? I am taking a look at this particular exercise and the teacher is not around. The teacher was able to model how to solve this particular problem. What was the central idea that was given to us by the teacher? Right? So important for them to self-assess. So looking at the word regarding feedback if we are if we will be able to improve in these three items particularly the way we handle classes for the coming school year then i think attending this particular module is really something worthwhile because remember what what we remember what i told you a professional is someone who does not only belong to a profession in fact 
it's more than a profession, it's our vocation. And therefore, in order for us to be able to fulfill our, our role and responsibility as a teacher, bokare, right? We have to implement certain strategies, beginning with these strategies regarding feedback. So I would like now to invite you regarding your IRA. What is your insight regarding this particular first principle of teaching, particularly about feedback? Is there a reference material after this seminar that you would like to probably revisit, probably read for the second time, or even probably for the third time? And Probably the more the more the most important question. How will you be able to apply this next week? If you are if you have started the school year tomorrow or next month, or in the case if we have if we have colleagues in the public school, probably September 13, starting September 13 or 15. What is your IRA? What is my IRA? All right, let's take a look at the other half, the importance of collaborative learning. And we all know that when we talk about collaborative learning based on research, right, the teacher is able to provide the students with support, with feedback, is able to create a community where the students develop a sense of belonging. I belong to this particular class. I, I am proud of this particular group. I am proud of this particular section with opportunities for friendship. But I included collaborative lear learning not only because of the fact that it is a powerful teaching method. We just have to take a look at Johnson & Johnson. Of course, not the shampoo or the vaccine, but rather the brothers starting in the 1970s when they help develop cooperative learning as a proven and tested teaching method because it's about community. It's about community. It's about developing a sense of belongingness on the part of the students. It's about the students being emotionally attached, not only to the content, but also to the fact that they have pride in being a member of the group, in being a member of the class. Because if they are a member of the group, a member of the class, they have contributed something worthwhile to the success of the group, to the success of the class. So feedback, because it's about learning, cooperative learning, of course, it's a powerful teaching method, but it's also about being in a community. And I would like you to take care of the following. If you take a look at the second one, you have to have the right space, the right room. Well, in the, in the brick and mortar classroom, you have to have the right room. Meaning to say you have to reconfigure the classroom. You have to take care of how the classroom is arranged because the students will not be able to work well using cooperative learning if they're not facing each other, if they're not talking to one another, they're not in a position to do so. Well, in the context of online teaching and learning, you must be able to use an application, uh, whether Zoom or MS Teams or Google Meet. I don't know if this is available in Google Meet, wherein there are breakout rooms. Then you have to take a look at buy-in coming from parents, even coming from the students. Because sometimes they have questions about this particular method. Of, uh, well, we are also working along the line, along the idea that you have a repertoire of teaching methods and strategies. Right? And then having the right stance, that there are certain instances when students are sometimes better teachers than their teachers. Because the students will have an opportunity to explain a certain part of the story, a, a certain step in, in solving the, the problem in algebra, 
or other branches of maths, etc., from the perspective of a student. So take care of the following items. And of course, take note of the INGs. One, two, three, four, five. In order for you to become successful in using cooperative learning or collaborative learning or team-based learning or project-based learning. Kasi lahat yan has something to do with community. How do they form groups? What are the rules in that group? Do they follow the rules? When they brainstorm, when they discuss ideas, when you assign a leader, does that particular leader know how to facilitate the discussion? Know how to come up with questions? When they perform, when they report, when they ask questions, when they come up with a visual presentation or a graphic organizer, have they been taught? Have they been guided? Because you cannot leave them to their own devices. So forming, norming, storming, performing, and then adjourning. How do you close the discussion? How do they close the discussion? How do they bid farewell to the members of the group? How do they congratulate one another? How do they celebrate? Because adjourning kasi tapos na yung task, there will be another task. Or just like the case, okay, the practice of a good teacher, they are redistributed to other groups. Forming, norming, storming, performing, adjourning. It's a two-pronged approach. The director of a class. And I give importance to feedback. I give importance to community. Feedback as the engine of learning, right? Community because I want to build uh, the identity of the student, the student identifying himself with the class, with the group. Number one, number two. Because in my class, I want to emphasize learning. We are business-like here. That's why I exert a lot of effort I study the data, I study my students, then I give them feedback. And I take time to make sure that the students learn in a group, that they're successful in learning in a group. Because I want to build friendship. I want to build a community. I want them to identify themselves not only as a lone learner. They're alone in this particular in this particular journey and remember it rings a bell also because we're, we're 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 doing online teaching and learning online and distance education right it rings a bell do you know that the research is quite clear that the number one enemy in online distance online and distance learning or education is loneliness facelessness loneliness or facelessness that's why the students long to see the face of the teacher they long to hear the voice of the teacher that's why when you talk about videos right instead of uh in, the students prefer not the youtube video the youtube video which is probably professionally made okay siguro okay talagang professionally made the content is very good but more than the content, more than the professional quality of the video, they long for a screencast video made by the teacher because they can hear the voice of the teacher. It's very reassuring. And they say, they, they probably, well, if you can project yourself there, they see the face of the teacher. I'm not alone here. And what more if they get to work in a breakout room with their classmates? What more if they get to work with their classmates? Solving a problem, answering an exercise, probably even a collaborative quiz. Especially nowadays because of the apps that we are using, collaborative quiz, not graded, formative, right? not stressful. They can be used, can be utilized. It's a two-pronged approach. 
quick right i would like to everyone how do i improve my knowledge and skills as a class director as a class director Okay, probably the quickest one minute again. Uh, let's take a look at the second one. And the second one is the learner's background. I know my students. I know Anna. I know Enrico. I know Ernie. I know Manny. Right? It's just like it's just like the good old teacher. Well, good old teacher because we're taking a look at the pre-pandemic teacher, the good teacher who is there at the door of the classroom welcoming the students before they enter the classroom probably shaking hands probably patting them on the back it's the good teacher who comes to the class nine o'clock ang start ng klase 855 850 nandun na siya talking to some students especially those students who are seated at the back especially students who are probably not reciting okay so meaning to say, a good teacher, quote unquote, quote unquote, waste time with the students. Waste time with the students. Because it is important for the teacher to know his or her students. Because the students are, hindi sila postage stamps eh. So it betrays my age as a teacher. It betrays my number of years as a teacher. Because I remember many years ago when I started uh, teaching, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, we asked the students to give us their picture and then we have a, a folder and then we paste the pictures of the students for a record book. My number sila, number one, number two, number three, number four. See, number one, getting a 1.25 or 197. See, number two, etc. They're not postage stamps they're not postage stamps they're persons they have a background they have a life they have a family they have a community where they come from and it is important for us to know them because how can we teach them if we don't know them it's just like Jose Rizal or all over again right because also I'm a history teacher it says that it's result all over again. Okay, how can you how can you give? Why would you give the bride to the bridesmaid if the bride does not love her because he does not know her? It's important. Why should you right? Why should you give the Philippines? Why should you fight for the Philippines when you don't know her? We don't love her. Okay, As Our students are not postage stamps. That's very important. And therefore, the first proposal that I would like to make regarding the learner is that we have to create a culture, not only an environment. This is how we do things around here. This is how we do things around here. Look at our motto. Look at, look at our coat of arms. Look at our rules and regulations. But more important than those, those artifacts is the way we utter words, the way we deal with people, whether online or in the brick and mortar classroom. You have to build relationships because those relationships are the cornerstone of the people who are under you in terms of their pursuit of development. They listen because they know that the person who is talking to them is someone who cares for them. He looks after their best interests. Hindi ba character education yun? Another angle of character education is a teacher who looks after the best interests of the people under him or her. We have to create that particular environment. 
And in doing so, it is, this is all about flourishing. This is about what positive psychology has been telling us. That yes, it's okay to take a look at the weaknesses, point for improvement of our students, but also appreciative inquiry, right? To inquire also what are the strengths of our students in order to take advantage of those strengths, in order to make them better or to contribute to the improvement probably of a peer, of a classmate. And one of the teaching methods that we can probably use is expert. Okay, who are the experts in my class? We're taking a look at the idea that, uh, we're taking a look at the idea that there are different cities. That when we say capital city, that a capital city like Manila is different from a capital city like Washington, D.C. Who among the students in my class have gone to Washington, D.C.? I know there are two based on my conversation. Okay, And then I will give them the title experts, quote unquote. And the students in my class can interview them. Who have gone to Madrid? Who have gone to Moscow or Moscow? All right. So it is about building on their strengths also. So I would like to invite you to take a look at that particular point regarding the learner background and regarding building a culture of caring. So a lecture wrapper, just an opportunity for you to reflect. When was the last time my students experienced positive emotions in my class? How did I make it happen? The point here is that I am a caring teacher. I am a caring teacher. Let's take a look at the other one. Uh, introducing the other one, there are various types of relationships with their classmates, caring classroom, with their teachers, with oneself. Because especially nowadays, we have to promote the well-being of the person. We have to take care especially of the mental health or the mental well-being of our students. But another type of relationship that sometimes we neglect is there is a relationship with the curriculum. And here, I would like to focus on that particular relationship. Because when the teacher focuses on that type of relationship, the teacher creates and designs a learning environment wherein there is a connection between the student and the textbook, between the student and the big idea in the unit plan, between the student and the curriculum. The curriculum becomes alive. It's not only the formal curriculum now. It's not only the taught curriculum, yung tinuro ng teacher. Right? But it is the learned curriculum, yung natutunan ng bata. So here, what it emphasizes is the point that we have to connect our pedagogy with the student, with the way the student learns, or the needs of the students, the interests of the student, Although many times in the research literature, in the research literature, it has been discredited, maybe even in the learning style of the student, especially in the family background, the community background. And therefore, what we are interested in are not only the four here, but also these questions. What are they afraid of? What do they long for? What is their background knowledge? What, it, what is their family background? What is their community? Uh, especially in the context, well, uh, in, in all types of schools, this is very important. Uh, for example, I remember in the public schools, some students are have a difficulty of paying attention, concentrating because of an empty stomach 
which you don't normally encounter or see or experience in a private school. I remember also observing classes in in among the among the aitas and I asked the teacher why is it that half of the class are not present because half, half of the class sir are in their farming community it's harvest season what are they afraid of what do they long for so it's a one-two punch combination, the caring teacher and the cared for learner. The caring teacher and the cared for learner, right? Just a short one, okay? Uh, also meant to make, to make you reflect. Write a short letter to a fictional colleague of yours, fictional, because I don't think that this particular typology or type of a teacher exists, even though the research literature uh, has this particular classification, the tyrannical teacher. The authoritarian meron, pero meron kayang tyrannical teacher. So tingin ko wala. So sige, isali natin. The tyrannical teacher. Okay. Convince him okay, that being caring is something that is important. That is, it is a principle of effective teaching. The caring teacher, the cared for learner, particularly when you design a learning environment according to the needs, the interest, the learning style, the aspirations of that particular person whom you are taking care of. Let's take a look at the third one. And the third one is learning the essential content. What is the most important things, items, content, ideas that we need to teach our students? And this is a naturally recurring question. The older teachers here must have encountered this particular recurring question when you were using understanding by design. And even before understanding by design, the idea of the concept-based curriculum and instruction or where understanding by design got its ideas, the root of its ideas, the Harvard framework called teaching for understanding, right? Because here, the question now is, we have, the, the, the point now is, we have to uncover rather than cover. Because when we uncover, we look at the most important content that we need to teach our students, right? And basically, these are what we call concepts, probably a theme, probably a macro skill, because that is worth teaching. And if we have identified them, we have identified them in a unit plan because a lesson plan will not be able to do it because when you identify a theme, when you teach a theme, right? When you plan teaching a theme, a concept or a big idea, or in the words of understanding by design, an enduring understanding, you need a huge block of time, a big block of time, probably a month, probably three weeks, probably two weeks, but you cannot do it in just one lesson. Kaya unit planning, medyo mahaba-haba. What is worth teaching? And I would like to argue uh, uh, this perspective, this particular principle of effective teaching from the principle of learning for the 21st century. Uh, this is a book published in 2019, Learning for the Age of Artificial Intelligence. And the author identified eight education competencies. Aside from the four C's, critical thinking, collaboration, communication, creativity, the author, based on research, extensive research, by the way, argues that students, in order to prepare them to tackle the issues of the 21st century, must be, must be civic-minded. 
they must be able to learn how to participate in a civic community. So in, again, we are reminded of the book Bowling Alone, right? It has to be bowling together. It cannot be alone. The, the students will have to free themselves from an isolationist mentality. They have to take part in the community. Uh, to take a look at collaborative activity, it's just five. I did not, uh, I did not uh, copy here the eight. Take a look at the one, the forces collaboration. But the author said, teach them facilitating skills in doing collaborative activity. It's, it's more than collaboration, but having the facilitative skills or facilitating skills. And then take a look at critical thinking, but the ability to learn efficiently and to be able to evaluate information because of fake news, especially in social media. Then take a look at the fifth one, to develop confidence, to develop efficacy as a learner. I can do this, but more than that, I can do this. I can do it because I can search for the right information. I can interview the right person. I know where to look for this particular answer to the problem. I have the skills. I have the knowledge. So learning for the 21st century, because when we talk about this learning for the 21st century or was it what, what is worth teaching, it has to be in the context of the 21st century problems and issues. Sorry, the word century is missing there. Especially in the case of the Philippines, right? These are complex problems. Poverty, rebellion, revolution, or what we are experiencing right now, a massive public health problem. We have not seen it before. I mean, not, not, uh, not after the Great War. And the Great War ended in 1918. And as early as 1917, you already have the Spanish flu. And some pundits in history are saying that the war ended because of the Spanish flu, because of the COVID-19, quote-unquote, during that time. It hastened the end of the war. I could still remember it ended on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. November 11, 1918. But what hastened it? The pandemic, according to some historians. So deal with 21st century problems and issues. And therefore, the idea of deep learning the idea of deep learning, this is, uh, the, this is uh, a, a word from Michael Fulan. In order, for, in order to prepare the students to use their competencies, you have to make them competent. They should know the content. But what is your parameter for them to know the content? That they can use the content. They can apply the content to deal with 21st issues and problems and dilemmas. Because we live in a complex world. And besides, if you take a look at the advantage, the other advantage is from a job perspective, very practical perspective, that they cannot be replaced by robots, by artificial intelligence. Okay, so I would like to invite you to reflect on this by using this particular activity. Support the statement below. Do I invite my students to regularly take a deep dive into the content? Do I minimize teacher talk? Do I identify the central ideas in the content that I am teaching? Do I provide them with the opportunity to actively think about that content? And do I combine it, a deadly combination, with choice, with voice, because I provide the students with choice to do a project, with choice to be able to collaborate with someone else instead of doing it in isolation. What I'm trying to point out is that there are many ways 
that you can employ in order for the students to take a deep dive at the content. But a non-negotiable is the deep dive into the content, deep learning. Consider the following one, two, three, four, five. I'm sure you're very familiar with one, two, three, four. But the fifth one is something that will surprise you. Because according to many research studies, the students are engaged with their work, are engaged, are will 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 oblige with the request or even a requirement coming from the teacher to take a deep dive into the content because what they are doing goes beyond themselves. Because their project, their portfolio, their performance task will not only be displayed but will have an impact in the lives of people in their classroom, outside of their classroom, or even in the community. I remember one particular Don Bosco teacher who told me that uh, in the reading classes that he handles, in the religion reading classes that he handles, the students will make a storybook. But that particular storybook was not only meant in to, well, it was meant to make sure that the students have the competencies in that religion class, in that reading class. But at the same time, those books, storybooks, sometimes they are big books, will not only be for display or for grading purposes, but they will be shipped to other Don Bosco schools in the provinces that the grade one students will use. Self-transcendent purpose. It has an impact on the school and the community. And the students are willing enough to take a deep dive into the content because of that self-transcendent purpose. So it's not only service learning. It's not only community-based learning, but I'm sure there are many practical methods that you can think of wherein the students will take a look at the deep dive into the content coupled with this one. There is an impact beyond themselves. So the learner at the center, okay, it's a great tandem. They actively think about the content, and then they go beyond themselves. All right, so write a brief memo to your coaches waiting for you to tell them something about this principle, the third one. Okay, let's take a look at the last one quickly. Provide them with opportunities to learn. We have to ask ourselves, how do I maximize learning in my classes? How do I offer choices for my students to tell me that they have learned? To tell me that they have learned. Do I practice appreciative inquiry? Do I spend time with them? Do I not only focus on their mistakes, but also their interests? The things that they bring into the discussion, particularly when it comes to teaching and learning. So, here, we highlight the use of what we call scaffolding, okay? And more than the scaffolding is the keyword support. What particular doorways and pathways do you open for the students in order for them to converse with the curriculum? For them to be able to understand the content. Okay, remember opening because scaffolding is opening. Yes, scaffold is just like building, okay? But, but a better metaphor, a better way of understanding scaffolding is the teacher opening a door and inviting the student to come inside to be able to sit and read, to be able to view probably a movie or to be able to hear an audio recording, etc. We're opening the door for them. And this is, this is crucial for student success because it's, it's when the three, the three things there are about the student. OK, 
okay? Being introduced to new knowledge and skills, et cetera, et cetera, when they plan and do performance tasks. Because the scaffolding, opening the door, providing a pathway for them, is the teacher thinking aloud. And when the students see how the teacher thinks, they learn. It's the teacher asking questions. It's the teacher modeling. Look at me, okay? Listen to me. And sometimes, or many times, we forget that when we talk about scaffolding, it's not only about the techniques of thinking aloud, asking questions, or modeling, but a material could also be a scaffolding technique when you give them a well-structured handout, when you give them an activity that they could easily follow, or probably even not easily follow, but they have to think about it before they can follow it but still developmentally appropriate for them. It's challenging, but they find joy in that particular challenge. So here, the teacher is the expert, the students as the apprentice. And it's basically providing the learner with unlimited access to the curriculum. Whether that access, okay, opening the door because you provided them with different methodologies with different materials, much according to their needs, their interests, their style of learning. Okay. So in the fourth principle, okay, what are the key areas that in teaching I need to pay attention to? You can probably also include the three other principles because this is basically a concluding question for the second part. Okay, so we pose again the central teaching problem. Is it worth the time and effort to revisit one's teaching practices? And I hope the answer is a resounding yes. I hope the answer is a resounding yes. Right? So it's, uh, well, it's five o'clock. So I would like to end here. And I would like to thank everyone for providing with me with an opportunity to talk to you about a something that I'm very passionate about, which is teaching, learning, and improving it. So I, Mr. Rintoy is not around. I would just like to convey to everyone that in case you want a, you want to you want to receive a certificate, you have to email Mr. Rintoy at catalystpds at gmail.com. Okay, so thank you so much. I hope to see you again, hopefully in, in another session of the Catalyst. So what I did was just to follow the format of Catalyst. We did not have any breakout room session, etc., uh, because I was instructed to follow this particular format. But hopefully in another session, we'll be able to interact. All right. So... Maraming salamat po. So I will now leave the room, keep safe, and I hope that you'll be able to use, you'll be able to use the principles. Thank you also. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you.